Hello, I'm Dr. Bill McIver. I'm the director of the Wiser Mocha Simulation course. Thank you for choosing Wiser for this course. The goal of this presentation is to introduce you to some of the simulators and the equipment that you will use during your Mocha course. This is our SimMan simulator. You can see that he never opens his eyes. So if you have any questions about his level of consciousness, be sure and ask. And a cohort during the simulation will cue you into whether or not the patient's conscious or not, if it's not otherwise obvious from the simulation. He's breathing spontaneously now. This is what he looks like when he breathes spontaneously. It's important that you know that he's got speakers here, 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 and here for breath sounds, and a heart sound speaker here. Now, a lot of times when you listen to him with a stethoscope, you'll hear plastic rubbing on your stethoscope. That's what I hear most of the time. And so it's completely appropriate for you to say, I hear crackles. And then again, a cohort might come in and say, well, that's correct, doctor. Or uh, why don't you listen again because I think they're clear. Something to that uh, extent. Um, here are posts for electrocardiogram leads. He only has four of them. So when you want to hook up the electrocardiogram, put the white lead here the black lead here, the green lead here, and the uh, red lead down here, and you will have hooked them up to a five lead electrocardiogram. These posts are for defibrillation. We use a live defibrillator, so number one, obviously be careful with it because you could hurt yourself or somebody else. And number two, if you need to defibrillate the, the patient, be sure and put the pads here on these posts, and that will dissipate the charge. So he has bladders in his chest above his second rib, and you could do a needle thoracostomy here without hurting the mannequin. You can put a chest tube in the mannequin over here on the right side only. One of our jobs as simulation instructors is to make sure you don't hurt yourself or our reasonably expensive mannequins. So if you're going to do something that looks like it could hurt you or the mannequin, somebody will intervene and, and get you to stop. He also has a neck skin here that we can remove, and there's this simulated cricothyroid membrane. So you can do a, a needle cricothyrostomy on him, or you can cut his neck and do a cricothyrotomy, if need be. The mannequin has peripheral pulses. He has a left radial pulse, he has bilateral femoral pulses, and he has a left brachial pulse. We can manipulate the strength of the pulses, so if he's got a weak, poor pulse, you might be able to uh, differentiate that between a bounding pulse. If you push too hard, you might not feel it. So gently put your fingers over these areas and you can palpate a pulse in your simulated patient. Now there's some important idiosyncrasies that you should know about the mannequin that affect how easily he is to ventilate. From his body size and habitus, he looks like a 70 kilo uh, adult male, but his lungs are very, very stiff and non-compliant. We measured them once and they're one third of normal lung compliance. So said another way, even though he looks like he's 70 kilos, functionally he's about 150 or 180 kilos. His lungs are very, very stiff. The other thing is that the mask doesn't seat very well around his face. And so you're very likely to, prone to get a mask leak. So as you ventilate the mannequin, some suggestions are to splay out the mask like this. Start out at the tip bridge of his nose and roll it down around his face. Then hold it as you would any other face mask. And you've got to squeeze really hard to get his chest to go up and down. So these lung idiosyncrasies will have a couple of uh, implications for you. Number one, you should probably just turn the pop-off valve all the way off to face mask ventilate our mannequin. Number two, you can see that even with that turned completely off and with me squeezing the best I can, I can't maintain any volume in the bag because I'm just pushing it around his face. So what we'll often do is have a simulation cohort kind of slip in behind you here and hit the flush valve for you to keep the bag inflated and make it feel more realistic to you and give you more of an experience like you're uh, actually ventilating the patient. 
Now the compliance of this uh, mannequin's lungs cannot be adjusted. That is, he can either be ventilated to the best that he can possibly be ventilated, or it's impossible to mass ventilate him. And sometimes it's confusing to, to participants during simulation. So if you're ever confused about anything during our simulation, it's always appropriate to say, I'm trying to mass ventilate the patient now, am I being successful? Uh, most of the time, a cohort will probably step up and say, yeah, it looks to me like you're moving his chest, and they won't lie to you. Or if you're supposed to be able to figure it out some way during the scenario, look at the end tidal CO2, something like that, then maybe you'll experience silence. But for the most part, we try to hop in. We never try to fool you about whether or not you're uh, performing something or not. So if you have any questions, go ahead and ask. Now, for some of the nuances of direct laryngoscopy on this simulator, Number one, his neck is very, very stiff. So when you do direct laryngoscopy and you get in the right position to pick up, oftentimes the whole head will come up with it. So here and again is a place where a confederate or maybe one of your colleagues helping you with the simulation may come and help you extend his neck a little bit better to give you a better view. The other thing you should know is that this mannequin has a very anterior and superior airway. Right now I have the Mac blade in the right position. You can see how much blade is outside of the mannequin's mouth. I can always tell when medical students are intubating the mannequin inappropriately when they've got a lot of blade inside the mouth. And usually that means that they're using the Mac blade like a Miller blade and they're picking up the epiglottis as opposed to being in the vollecula. With this mannequin you can still sometimes get a view of the larynx doing it like that but the tube will tend to slide into the esophagus. So I suggest you look for the epiglottis. Be aware that it's going to be a little more superior and anterior than you're used to. And, but overall, the mannequins are not too difficult to uh, do direct laryngoscopy and endotracheal intubation on. Mm -hmm. You can use adjuvant airway devices like a uh, laryngeal mask airway or a combi tube, and you'll need to in some of our scenarios. You can use those on our mannequins. The things to know about them is plastic rubbing on plastic can make these things difficult to put in. So we have a little bit of mannequin lube. Give it a little squirt, and that will be your lubrication. We'll try to remember to squirt the airway for you. Sometimes we forget. And to place an LMA inside this mannequin is very much like putting it into a patient. Drop it down to about right here. Find the back of it with your finger and shove it in until it doesn't shove any further. Now some of the mannequins, the LMAs seat very, very well in and it looks great and they, they ventilate very easily with them. Some of them not so much. So again, this might be a place where a cohort steps up and says, you know, you are ventilating very nicely, doctor. I can see his chest going up and down. Or uh, I don't see any chest movements. If you might need that extra cue. This is an example of a right main stem intubation in our simulated patients. And you can see the endotracheal tube is quite deep inside of him. It's the, the usual depth that you're used to for a normal uh, mid-tracheal intubation is correct in this mannequin. In other words, 21 or 22 centimeters at the teeth usually equals a, a, a mid-tracheal intubation. But anything too much deeper than that, and you'll probably be in the right main stem bronchus. As I squeeze the bag and start to ventilate his chest, maybe you see the right side only coming up here and the left not moving quite as much. What you need to know is that in these mannequins, they have this one solid plate across their chest. And so as even the right lung goes up, the left one will come up a little bit with it. Uh, however, if we listen for breath sounds right now, we'd only hear breath sounds in the right lung in these speakers here, which correspond to this spot on the mannequin's chest and not over here on the left. So that's a right main stem intubation. So in terms of the airway, there's a couple of fun things we can do with the mannequin as well. We can give it trismus, and now it's impossible to open up the thing's mouth and get in there with a laryngoscope blade. We might do this because the scenario called for trismus. The patient got a second dose of succinylcholine or even a first dose of succinylcholine, and now they've developed trismus. Or we might do it as a way to keep you from getting into the upper airway. So in other words, to force you to cut a tracheostomy or something like that, a cricothyrotomy. Um, we might also have done it a few times when people are giving, uh, trying to do direct laryngoscopy and have forgotten to give muscle relaxant. So if we thought the patient should have too much muscle tone and you're not able to open up the mouth, maybe a cohort would say to you, oh, he's got so much muscle tone, doctor, and that would help remind you that you need to give a muscle relaxant in order to do direct laryngoscopy. Um, we can also uh, lock up his neck and decrease his cervical range of motion. 
take out the pillow here, you might see that a little better. And now his neck can't really be extended. And again, this could be used uh, for say a, a patient with a, a broken neck or a diabetic patient, or it could be used another uh, way for us to uh, uh, make sure that you're not able to do direct laryngoscopy. And so you've got to go ahead and, and do something else. Um, you can't see this if I did it right now, but I can also give him pharyngeal obstruction so I can swallow his pharynx or, or swallow his tongue. Again, generally these are used to keep you from doing conventional direct laryngoscopy, although obviously those uh, situations might be consistent with uh, anaphylaxis or something of that ilk. Um, <clears throat> he has uh, malleable vocal cords that we can lock together or not. So in other words, we can send him into laryngospasm or not. Sometimes we do this um, to simulate an upper airway obstruction, like when the tongue's in the back of the throat and you need to place an oral airway. Or it could obviously be used for a case of laryngospasm if that's what we were trying to simulate. He also has uh, little apertures on both of his main stem bronchi that allow us to cut one of them off or, or turn them back on. Um, what you should know is that these are all uh, on or off kinds of phenomenon. We can't give him partial uh, bronchospasm, at least not with this mannequin. It's either uh, one lung is on or one lung is off. And the same thing is true of his vocal cords. The same thing is true of the direct laryngoscopic view that we can give you. He's either really as easy as he is to get uh, the best direct laryngoscopy view, or he's impossible to view with a laryngoscope blade. Now one thing that's been kind of confusing for some participants is sometimes we'll lock up his mouth, for example, during a scenario, and maybe his neck as well. And this makes it impossible to do direct laryngoscopy on the mannequin, but it doesn't really affect your ability to mass ventilate him. So we might be trying to set up a can ventilate but cannot intubate kind of scenario. So if, if you're in the middle of one of these, just like in the real world, go ahead and mass ventilate the patient. And then if you want to place a, uh, an LMA in the patient, that's your next thought, go ahead and try. Um, some, some participants have come in and said, well, his mouth is really stiff and I can't put an LMA in, but if it's uh, in our learning objectives for you to go ahead and do that, when you pull out your LMA and poise it over the mouth, we would then turn all that off, and all of a sudden it'd be very easy to put an LMA in, and you'd keep going with that. If you saw us doing that and then pulled out your laryngoscope blade and tried to do that, we'd have to go ahead and lock up the mouth again to try to keep you from uh, doing something besides what we're trying to get at in terms of our learning objectives.